preliminary work. Um, it was excavating where the collections were, and we talked about that yesterday, and it was, of course, dissemination of knowledge about where the collections are and what is in the collection. Um, the session that we have now is presenting all the efforts that were made, not only by Be Magic, but by other, like Lutz Zerner, by Richard Krengel, then um, by Koa uh, uh, van Nistenstaal, van Erfgoed Norre Kimpen, and Brecht de Klerk van Memo. They will tell you what happens outside B-Magic and what will happen soon, especially for Memo. And at the end of this session, we'll address some questions of conservation and restoration with Angela Santos and Marcia Villarigues. Please, Evelyn, because we will be the first one. Uh, yeah, you yeah. present you yourself. Oh, yeah, okay. And then I <laughs> okay, continue. Yeah. I'll present <laughs> myself. Um, maybe as you can read in the booklet, <laughs> I'm Evelyn. Um, <laughs> I'm um, part time. Uh, postdoc on Be Magic, uh, as you heard yesterday from somebody else, um, but also part-time um, administrator and coordinator. So I arranged vis visits to archive collections and then telling everybody, oh, you can find this over there, this over there. So this we will uh, present you a little bit later. Um, okay. yeah. and, um I'm a hidden archivist, uh, I was director of museum, uh, senior curator, and uh, yeah, I had a, a lot of, I dealt a lot with conservation questions, I was project uh, leader of a very, very expensive digitizing project before I started this digitizing project here for BMagic. So we do now our presentation and it will be, uh, yeah, sometimes she will take, uh, she will talk about it and sometimes it's me. And I start with the first slide, which you have seen already yesterday. Um, our first step was to map Belgian collections, as we told you yesterday. In the beginning, when uh, Kurt, Frank, Neil and I wrote the project, we did a little inquiry in Belgium. We sent letters to about 30 institutions and we got responses and at the end of our inquiry, because we had to make sure that we could do it, we were, um, we knew that at least we would find 95,000 slides in different collections. Today, of course, together with uh, Evelyn and others, uh, we went to a lot of collections, uh, let's say about uh, two thirds of the collections we have visited. And we know now that we have at least 200,000 slides in Belgian collections. And I wonder what will Mimo tell us, because I guess Momo, um, which is a project uh, which is only for Flandern. We did the whole country except except uh, for the German region where we didn't go. But we did Brussels, we did Flandern, and we did uh, Wallonia. So um, we um, know that uh, there is much more out there. We couldn't get access to everything, of course. It was just, we had only four years. And uh, our idea was to make the slides accessible. Sometimes we had even to do an inventory because the slides had a low priority in almost every archive. There were hardly any inventories. There were no cataloging or rough cataloging, um, almost no preservation. So they were not in the, yeah, in the preservation envelopes and in the boxes. So what you see here this is about 50 institutions. Um, we visited maybe more, but uh, no, we have, we know about maybe more, but uh, two thirds, as I already said, was visited. What you can see um, in, on the others here, you see it's uh, not really um, well distributed. This is Mons with the Mundaneum in the south. 
This is Leuven with uh, two big, uh, no, no, sorry. This is Leuven with two big collections, CADOC and the university. This is Brussels with uh, 18 different collections. This is Ghent with 13 different collections. And this here is Antwerp with seven different collections. So you see the um, collections are, are the biggest are up to 40,000 and uh, with ULB in Brussels we have 19,000 so this is a bit the big collection and then sometimes you have maybe 1,000 or 500 and uh, we scanned them, we selected the different collections according to what we needed. It was mainly Belgian colonies, secular and religious teaching, spiritual teaching, um, thanks to Céline who came later, we concentrated on color, but um, we uh, tried to use this, to, to scan the slides we would use later for our research. Okay. This is um, a very, um, this is a bit strange to see it like this, um, a glimpse of, of what we saw in the archives, as you can see, um, a lot of cardboard boxes, shoe boxes, wooden boxes, metal boxes, all kinds of different uh, conditions in which they were stored. And um, also very different formats. You have mechanical slides, toy slides, photographic slides, and so on. Um, so this diversity is exciting, but it's also um, a bit the pitfall of the collections, because if you uh, ask uh, archivists, do you have lantern slides in your collection? And then they, they look it up for you and they say, yeah, we have three beautiful colored slides. And then if you ask them what kind of slides are they, then they come up with the toy slides, because we say we're from the magic, magic lantern. So, uh, and then you have to explain, oh, but also, diapositives, these are also slides, they are, these are projected. So this is something we learned that you really have to explain what the medium is about because otherwise you cannot find them. They are not inventoried uh, most of the time, they are stored together with photonegatives. So uh, that's something we learned that you really need to explain what is it about and to tell them look in your photographic collections and go through the, the, the glass plates and so on. And then uh, most of the time they say, okay, we find some. And then two weeks later they say, oh, we found another box in another corner and a bit later another one. So it's always very, sometimes it's really dispersed um, in the one archive or a museum. Yeah. Yeah, there's a slide. I, oh, this one. Um, something more about the diversity. I think if you look at in a very um, generalized way, you can see like there are different kinds of collections. You have like the massive collections, like for example, the Ghent University, which is a beautiful one because when we discovered the collection, it was still stored in the original place, so in the HICO, the art um, center, where they have a projection unit. Um, besides the auditorium with the uh, gaps still in the wall and then you have these wood wooden boxes filled with thousands of, of lantern slides um, so that was a nice discovery so you see that the uh, collections related to education which can be very broad schools universities but also popular educa education like in Mundaneum uh, where lectures public lectures were held these are really the largest slides with photographic slides but also beautiful hand colored um, slides and so on and then you have another collection uh, or, or another category which are like more the toy slides in folk museums like Heus van Alleen Mass um, uh, Muka, uh, uh, not Muka, yeah, that's, that's from Muka, but um, also um, uh, Speelhut Museum, Mechelen, and so on. So these are large collections with mainly hand colored slides, toy slides, older slides. And then another collection, another category are the media archaeology uh, collections, like Cinematheque, Freeling Collection here in Antwerp. These are really like etalages uh, demonstrating all the different kinds of possible lantern slides, lanterns, and, and so on. So the next slide is missing something. There was marked Belgium question mark. Why Belgium question mark? 
in Belgium, what is the special situation in Belgium? Belgium is not a producer country. So uh, when uh, you look into the archives, you normally find self-made slates, eight and a half by 10, uh, mostly photographic ones. Uh, very rarely, if you find commercial slides, they are from Germany, and France, mostly the children's slides, and uh, sometimes uh, some specimen in eight by eight from the United, uh, from from UK, but hardly ever from uh, the United States. Uh, so the mostly self-made slates were made by talented amateurs, um, sometimes less talented because then you have uh, yeah, slides that are flat <laughs> and grey. And sometimes it's done with the help of a photographic atelier. Our old hypothesis was, before we started with the project, and it was in 2017, that Belgium is on the crossroad of different uh, trade routes. So that meant that for us that slides would come from Germany and the east, uh, in the north, England, in the south from France. This is true for the Lenten toy slides. Uh, so um, you can find them, you can tra trace them back to the middle of the 19th century. But uh, what you have normally is um, that there were huge congregations or congregations that had a lot of connections with other congregations in other countries. So this was their way in getting, if they didn't it themselves, while they were on mission tours, um, they got slides from their sister and brother congregations. And for the universities, a lot of Belgian university professors and teachers went abroad. So they knew about the foreign producers and they just went there or ordered them from other countries so that they were actively uh, bought and not they didn't wait until they came to Belgium. Um, this is a, a brief um, uh, overview of uh, why do we digitize? Because we are not a conservation uh, organization, we are a research organization, of course. These lantern slides mostly are not in the best state uh, conserved, so it's really important that they are digitized to... to um, yeah, be sure that they stay there for another hundred years. But um, especially for us as researchers, it's also important that they are digitized in order to uh, investigate them. Because if you open up a collection, you see the yeah, dark slides, you need a light box to enlight them. Um, so if you have a digitized image, you have immediately the, the enlightened uh, image. Also, uh, with the digitized version, you can zoom in, you can go to the details. Of course, it's not the same experience that, as, you, as you would see them projected, but at least it's better than this uh, standard format um, version. And another advantage, so the zooming in, and it's also yeah, much, yeah, you can work much faster if you have to unwrap um, collections where every slide is wrapped in individually, it's really a hell of a job actually to go through the collection and to find out what is inside. So uh, also in, in that case it's interesting to have the digitized slides um, and of course to open up all this information, digitized images, you can put them on the databases and so on, you can work on an international level and, and share the images which is also a huge uh, advantage. But so on the other hand, it's also important to uh, keep on going to visit collections because sometimes you, ha you find little clues. Um, for example, on wooden boxes you have a title because, yeah, as Sabine already mentioned, often very little context, but with these little mentioning on boxes, for example, there a wooden box from AMSAP mentions Arm Vlaanderen, and indeed if you look at the slides, and then they, they indicate it's from uh, lectures about, th this was a popular topic and so on, um, sometimes handwritten notes from, from speakers and so on. But of course, yeah, things get, uh, uh, yeah, Melanged, uh, mixed afterwards, so um, you, it's not always very uh, uh, yeah, authentic, let's say, but still that is also very important to uh, look at the context of the archive. So from... Yeah, the next one, please. Yeah, 
So from our own experience, what can we say about the scanning project? Uh, very often you have to start as a researcher doing your own inventory because nothing is done. And we had to do it because we wanted to know what is in the collections to select it. Then the question of course, um, all, do you scan all or just a selection? If it was a smaller one, let's say up to 1,500, 2,000 slides, then we decided to do it all because very often you just discover when you go through the scans what the selection criteria were. You can't see it very often at the first sight. Then, of course, don't forget the scan, to scan the documents which go with it because uh, they are not very, very, you can't find them very often. So it's really, really, really necessary to understand how they were used, these scans. Then, best is to do them recto verso because uh, if there are information on both sides, you should keep them, even if this doubles your uh, number of scans, uh, keep all the information. And for us, it was very important to know what we can do with the slides. So when uh, we worked with different archives, we signed a contract so that we know what we may do and the archive has agreed to certain things and know what um, the purpose is of uh, our keeping the scans in our own uh, unaccessible, only for us accessible database. And of course, what is important, and this is uh, what we yeah, should have done maybe better, see whether the archive we're working with has an infrastructure, an IT infrastructure, to ingest all the gigabytes that come. And sometimes uh, you're, they, get a bit, they got a bit in trouble, but we always saved it. Uh, So the, the first uh, steps of the digitization process were made already before BMagic with the Million Picture project. So there was already some expertise and then Sabine, she took the first steps for BMagic to digitize the ULB collection with special funding from ULB and therefore she had the collaboration with Iwana. So an external scan firm uh, who did that for, uh, for her. And then afterwards, uh, there was COVID, of course, so we couldn't go to the archives anymore. But afterwards, like last year from March on, when everything was opening up, we could go again to the archives and start with the digitization uh, process. And um, we also uh, had external firms for the standard format slides. Um, but we also developed uh, our own setup with a very good camera. Um, and that is thanks to Bart Muns and his partner uh, Hilke Areis, who is also in the advisory board of the MEMO project, I heard. Um, she's very, uh, has a lot of expertise in, in scanning heritage objects. So we had a setup with a camera, um, side lights, um, a light box underneath and our laptop and like this everybody from Be Magic with the manual is able to make uh, qualitative scans which are uh, very good. Afterwards you need some time to crop everything so therefore we have a, a, a job student Umaima who is also here so if, if you want more information uh, you can uh, definitely uh, ask her uh, more information. So um, yeah that's a bit how we worked. So to conclude, um, we worked not only with our, a commercial company, Iguana, we worked with a former restaurer from, uh, Amps, uh, from, from Rotterdam, Herman Maas, because we had uh, some slides, 800 slides that were in difficult uh, yeah, preservation state. So he did the uh, cleaning because all the slides were cleaned before they were scanned. So thank you very much uh, to Hermann Maas. We have to thank uh, Kau Leuven, Bruno uh, van, uh, sorry, van der Meulen, merci, uh, who scanned five other collections. Uh, that was uh, Heilig Graf in Turnhout, Museum Dr. Gislain in Ghent, Musée de la Photographie in Charleroi, saint Uzerlin Institut uh, Onze Lieve Frau in Wave. And what we still have to to do is the municipal, the Charles Bulls collection of, uh, kept by the municipal archive in Brussels. In total, we will have done about, with uh, the lab in uh, Leuven, about uh, 12,000 skins. 
um, 3,500 scans from ULB with Iguana and Hammond Mars, and uh, a lot of slides that were scanned by ourselves with the photograph, as Evelyn just said, and we have about 20,000 scans in our slide. The result can be read thanks to a lot of articles that were published since 2018. There is a book outside, uh, Face in a Beam of Light. There will be another book, as you heard yesterday. And I hope there will be five wonderful PhD theses defended in 2023. Thank you very much for your attention. So, and now the first speaker is uh, Brecht de Klerk from MEMO. Um, he is a past in archival work in Belgian public broadcast. Uh, he is counselor of media institutions and of the Flemish Ministry of Culture. He is at this moment the 11th president of the International Federation of Television Archives and he will present MIMO and the scanning project. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sabine, and thank you to the organization for, for having us here. Um, I think uh, when hearing uh, the colleagues about, about uh, their project and your scanning ambitions and what you have done already, I think what I'm going to present is very much complementary to that in the sense that uh, our project is um, very much aimed at uh, glass slides, glass plates um, as an umbrella category of this kind of uh, photography. So it connects very well to... Um, to what is already being done in the Be Magic project, and in fact, um, quite a few of the of the institutions that I saw passing are also partners in our project, but then not for the lantern plates, but for the um, remaining quantities of glass plates in general. Um, what I want to quickly run through with you today is uh, first I want to say something about GIF because uh, our funders require this from us. It's the European Union. We're doing this with m money from. Uh, taxpayers' money, so they need to be acknowledged. And um, I will go quickly through the first phases of the, the uh, project that have already been uh, finalized, and then I'll highlight three aspects of the project, namely the preparation of the material, the digitization itself, and the ac archiving and access ambitions that we still uh, are doing. Um, I think what is important here is to highlight a few challenges and, and, and benefits of a unique and collaborative, I would say, but centrally coordinated approach. And that is what, may, what makes uh, MIMO unique. Um, and I'll tell you more about, about uh, MIMO uh, further on, but let's start with um, acknowledging our funders is, uh, is the European Union, the, uh, the EFO, um, the European Fonds for Regional Entwickel, the European Fund for Regional Development. Um, who gives us the money through the, um, the um, it's the post-corona relaunch, economic relaunch uh, funds that we are calling upon here. Um, what is our project? I think our project um, uh, is, is really a catch-up movement in uh, high quali highly qualitative digitization and digital access to, to Flemish heritage on several domains, not only to glass plates, but also a chance uh, to share expertise with, with the Flemish heritage uh, sector. As, as some of you might know, Belgium is a federal country in which the states are responsible for cultural heritage. Um, so it's, a, it's an opportunity for MEMO also to share expertise with, with that heritage sector about the specific challenges of large-scale digitization and, and new technologies uh, that are emerging in the field. Um, when we look more concretely, more precisely at the scope of our glass plate digitization project, we're talking about 170,000 from approximately 30 content partners. Um, what we are doing is um, they are preparing, they are reg registering and describing, packing and cleaning their glass plates and um, afterwards these uh, resulting files will be sustainably archived by MEMO and made accessible uh, on MEMO's platforms and on our content partners, uh, libraries, archives, museums in Flanders if they wish to do so, they are free to do so. What do we mean by glass plates in this, uh, uh, in this case? Um, we focus on uh, glass negatives, glass positives, uh, so-called glass slides, and also the lantern 
uh, slides there are also included to the extent that they haven't uh, haven't been already digitized, for example, within um, the Be Magic project. We do not consider uh, slides framed in glass or stained glass or other non-photographic glass objects. This is the um, timeline for our project. Uh, started in uh, 2021, in uh, over the summer, when we were um, preparing the project. Starting to write a tender took quite some time to prepare a, a digitization tender. I um, can imagine that as historians, and I'm an historian myself, you are not always acquainted with what, what, what's behind that. I mean, there's a lot of market research that you have to do. There is a lot of technical specifications that you have to research on because this is about um, preserving heritage in the most, preferably in the most authentic way. So there is a lot of um, attention, a lot of focus put on that. Then we start also uh, partially overlapping with the tender writing process. We uh, develop the logistics process because you can imagine if you handle the collections of glass plates, a very fragile uh, medium, I don't have to tell you that, if you, um, if you deal with such collections, 170,000 from more than 30 partners, there's a whole logistics process that goes behind it. So that as well uh, takes some time. And then in phase four, which will soon start within a few months, um, the digitization itself will start, will take approximately 13 months, and then uh, the archiving and access gradually moves on as soon as the slides or the resulting files are coming in on our sustainable storage infrastructure. A bit about the project preparation. Um, we needed to confirm the scope and, and the content partners because, I mean, that's also the work that uh, Sabina and her team have been doing probably, like identifying which, in, which institutions hold these kind of collections, not all of the institutions that are included in the Be Magic project are also eligible to become partners of MEMO. MEMO has a very uh, well-defined group, has very well-defined groups of content partners. I'm talking about libraries, archives, museums, government bodies, and performing arts institutions. So um, I saw, for example, Heile Graf Institute or, uh, or the, the school in Mechelen, the Ursuline Institute. Those are not um, typically not partners that would be eligible for our projects. Unfortunately, we cannot. Um, serve all kinds of institutions. We have to limit our scope somewhere. Um, as well, the extension of tooling and, and processes, of existing tooling and processes, for example, for the registration uh, and the packaging. Um, we had, as I said, the planning of logistical pro uh, processes, distribution of packaging materials as, and so on, and also research and documentation on digitization specifications. Um, those aspects are already uh, done. Um, and that's when we moved to uh, phase two of our uh, process. We started to do market research. We did a first um, tender. We published it in January uh, 22. We published it according to the uh, national legislation in Belgium, which was a bit unfortunate because uh, we got prices that were a bit higher than expected, which meant that according to the rules of our funders, we had to redo the tendering process. process. Very unfortunate, uh, of course, because that meant uh, two months of delay, and that's the reason why I cannot show you the first results of the digitization itself, and we will only start, presumably, in uh, July. Um, so this part is almost done, and then we can move to the logistics, because um, it might be an aspect that you, as, as historians, are not always confronted with, but this is, um, if, you, if you know that the situation is as... As Sabine said, a lot of chaos in the archives. Well, and you want to run such a project, of course, you have to bring order in the chaos. And, and that's what we are doing through um, shaping um, the logistical process of so packaging, um, supplying carrier barcodes, um, um, supplying cardboard boxes for those uh, who haven't got them yet. So that's, this kind of work is done on a daily basis in uh, 30 um, cultural heritage institutions or cultural heritage managing institutions in Flanders. We're talking about um, several hundreds of thousands of barcodes, for example. Can you imagine? Um, also, um, we had to define... We had to register technical characteristics. We have developed manuals for the archivists on how to register their glass plates because we asked them to, um, to register, for example, the format uh, version, the size, the preservation problems that they are encountering. Each of these is being registered as we speak for each and every glass plate. 
for each and every glass piece of, of these 170,000. If there is a label present on them, whether, um, whether it's color or black and white or tinted or toned or, 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 or whatever kind of uh, coloring process. So all these kind of aspects uh, have to be covered before we can even start registering. Um, not going to say too much about this, but um, also content-wise, we need a bit of uh, description. So we are noting, or we're asking the archivists to note uh, something about the title or the content, about the collection or the provenance, the producer, photographer, if known, uh, the place where the uh, picture was taken, and uh, the age, uh, approximately. It's rather exceptional that we ask this from our content partners in this phase, because um, uh, Memo, as you might know, um, we, we have been running a massive audiovisual digitization project, and there we explicitly required our partners not to describe the content, because the impact on the digitization process itself is rather limited, and the time that it takes to start describing audiovisual uh, content can be very long, and that would um, that would actually hamper the uh, the timelines of our of our projects. Here we have a bit more time, and the uh, need for content-wise description is a bit higher. So here we give them the opportunity to also describe, although um, the major work of description will have to be done at a later stage. Uh, I heard the um, Mechelen Toy Museum being mentioned, that's one of our partners, is actually, as far as I know, the only one that actually inc has included lantern plates in our project. So these are uh, a few examples of these, Contain featuring uh, some uh, nice examples or uh, not so nice examples of, of damage, of course. Um, I just want to highlight a few challenges here in the, in the, in the pre preparation um, in the preparation phase, which was, of course, the, as, as um, Sabine also mentioned, the differences in packaging, the differences in conservation and registration pr uh, practice. So MEMO offers different ways to deliver uh, these uh, registration data to us. We can import them on our systems as well. Um, fragmented material technical knowledge. Um, same as I can only confirm what, what Sabine said there. Um, we have, or we are organizing here at the Very Photo Museum in Antwerp a workshop in a few weeks where um, archivists from all over Flanders come together to recognize damage on glass plates. Um, we provide also an ex extensive manual, as we said, and also the workload. I mean, this is a challenge. The, these are large volumes to be packed and, and registered, as you can imagine. And MIMO provides additional full time registrars who actually travel in Belgium. So it's, we're talking two full-time equivalents who are traveling around in, in Belgium and um, actually um, help our content partners to uh, register. But the benefits are also um, important. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm trying to uh, avoid any arrogance or, or, or something here, but um, there is a strong advantage of scale. And we are um, providing packaging, barcodes, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. All these glass plates will be packed in, the, in uh, not exactly in the same way, because there is also pre-existing conditions. But um, to the extent that we can, we streamline the packaging. Um, technical and descriptive metadata are being standardized, or at least being standardized streamlined. Um, we are sharing our expertise, as I said, so all this kind of expertise can also be reused by these uh, archives in the future for their own ambitions and their own uh, projects. When we go to the digitization itself, um, that will run, as I said, from June, maybe July, until September 23. Um, there were two important collections, namely this very photo museum here in Antwerp and the University of Ghent, who said that they uh, preferred um, that their, trans that their uh, glass plates not be transported. Um, so we are doing it in situ here at the photo museum by an external service provider and the same accounts for the University of Ghent. Um, I'm not going to tell much about the process itself. It's pretty logic, it's pretty straightforward for those who know a bit about industrial scale uh, digitization projects. Um, we are digitizing um, as a master file towards a digital negative. We um, uh, have also had the advice of Bruno van der Meulen from uh, the, the KU Leuven, who helped us there. Uh, and we're adding also a mezzanine file, a TIFF, uh, uncompressed baseline TIFF 6.0, um, as an accessible file also to use uh, online. The metadata will be registered as a METS XML together with the EXIF metadata. 
Uh, challenges here um, contain also um, the differences in formats, preservation problems, et cetera, et cetera. But MEMO, as I said, centralizes these data to enable triage at the digitization partner so that they can shape their processes in an industrial way. Um, fragile material, so the transport is not always allowed. I've discussed that. And the workload stays, uh, stays, uh, stays huge. So um, that is also tackled thanks to that streamlining of that logistics uh, process. If we look at the benefits, um, once again, uh, strong advantage of, of scale, streamlining of technical specifications in the digitization and in the documentation, and also uh, file formats that are fit for needs. Unfortunately, I have to tell that the knowledge about sustainable file formats is not, um, not always widespread or not what you would hope it would be in the Flemish heritage sector. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a I would say it's an art on its own, I would say almost. So um, we are happy that we as MEMO can also um, raise the bar when it comes to this kind of um, digital preservation aspects. Then let's have a look at the final stage, the archiving and, as and access uh, part, which is um, by far the part in which we haven't invested uh, 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 the most uh, up, up until now. Um, it's uh, the, la the last part of our project and is therefore to be tackled only next year. But the plan is to ingest uh, the resulting files from the digitization uh, via SFTP. They will be delivered into our uh, sustainable storage um, infrastructure, uh, which is obviously um, a double infrastructure, one in Ghent and one near Bruges, and even with a um, uh, vaulted uh, LTO tapes in a bunker in the Netherlands. Um, they will be accessible for the content partners themselves through our media asset management system and then to be reused on Meet Memo's platforms. We are developing a platform that is still living under the name Archives 2.0, which is still under development and will, which will probably get another name. Um, challenges there, um, I think. It's a new kind of material for our archive system. As I said, um, MEMO has been busy throughout the, its existence, uh, mainly with uh, audiovisual content, um, me meaning moving image and, and sound. Um, so we have developed a new kind of submission information package. I don't know if there's any people in the room who are acquainted with OAIS language, but submission information package is the package that comes into the archive and then it's unwrapped and then stored, etc., etc. I'm not going to explain OAIS here, but um, it's also smaller files. Um, with all due respect, but but video files and digitized films are much, 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 much bigger than 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 photo files. Whereas our uh, storage infrastructures were, were primarily designed to contain huge files. So um, that is also um, that's also another way of thinking and another, another approach, approach for our storage team. And then also the rebuild of our main access uh, platform, as I said, Archives 2.0 will have to be able to contain and satisfy, uh, deliver a satisfying user experiences when it comes to these uh, still images. But the benefits, I keep on repeating, um, st strong advantage of scale thanks to this large storage infrastructure, fully exploits Moore's law. I think that is, that is a, a strong advantage. Central point of access for users, thanks to this platform, Archives 2.0, that is still under development. And also a larger, more diverse, and specifically targeted audiences, such as uh, educational, for example, um, which is already a uh, main audience of ours. So um, that is also being tackled. Summarizing, I would say that um, what I call the circle of quality and quantity is in a full swing here. What do I mean by that? Thanks to the fact that we are exploiting those economies of scale, we um, can use the money that we save there to increase our quality bar. And we use that money to push up the, um, the limits of quality. So. Um, we um, achieve, for example, a high quality uh, in, in, in terms of, of project management, um, which in itself creates, once again, space for higher quantities. And that itself leads, once again, to economies of scale. So that's, I think, one of the unique uh, advantages of an approach like MEMO, that we are um, tackling this kind of challenges in Flanders in a unique way, in a collaborative way. Um, and I think we can be proud of that. I'm happy to say that we get some um, some followers. Uh, 
around the world, some, some, some other countries that particularly like uh, our approach. And uh, I hope that um, this kind of projects can be an example also to, to, to other countries. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Brecht, for your uh, very inspiring talk and insights uh, on the MIMO um, project. Um, and then I'm very delighted to present you the next speaker, Cor van Istendaal. Um, I met him almost 20 years ago, I think, um, when uh, Cor worked at uh, Vleeshuis, um, which is a very nice museum here in Antwerp on music history. And uh, Cor, he's also a specialist in music history and dance history. He wrote in the meantime, or he finished last year, I think, his PhD on early, late 19th and early 19th century uh, dance, uh, dance repertoires, yes. And um, voila, today, in, in the meantime, he's the coordinator of a regional um, heritage organization. Uh, Erfgoed Noorderkampen, Erfgoed Saal Noorderkampen, and um, <clears throat> um, there he is also a coordinator of a, of a project to uh, use the, the slides digitized by Bimagic from the Hele Graf, the school collection, to implement them in their online database with the help of many volunteers. And I give the floor to Cor. Is the clicker there? Yeah, okay. All right. Right. Uh, hello there. I'm um, trying to look up and away from you. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, there are lots of logos on this first slide because there were a lot of partners in the project I'm going to present you. Uh, my own affiliation is as a volunteer researcher for Ghent University, but one of the main partners was, of course, uh, the Catholic University of Leuven and Kaldok Institution. You already know from other presentations uh, the last few days, I suppose. But um, um, Beside my uh, hobby project, which is my PhD, <laughs> I'm working full-time as a heritage coordinator, it is called, uh, for Erfurt Nordicamp, which is basically saying heritage northern Campina region in Belgium. And um, I'll try to get this click. Well, the region is the light blue one on, uh, very high uh, in the north of Belgium and these are the, the actual um, is the actual region I'm responsible for. What we're doing is actually helping every type of heritage organization, professional, non-professional, to achieve um, better collection management. And we're not only doing collections in archives or museums, but we're doing also archaeological collections, uh, monuments and uh, lapidaria, this kind of stuff. And also uh, traditions and, and this kind of uh, knowledge. Uh, it's very wide, <laughs> but my specialization is actually digitization of, uh, digitalization of collections uh, mainly. And um, we were doing this, one of our projects was uh, this one of the Heilig Graf in Turner. It's a large school. Um, I think nowadays with all their sites combined, 2,500 uh, pupils. Uh, it's, it's a very old school too because it was actually founded as a priory, as a cloister in 6062. So it's more than 350 years old. And um, this building isn't, but it's uh, still having a, a acquired monument status because it's very visual from the street in the, one of the main streets in, in Turnhout in the city. And it uh, is a lovely building, and uh, which was originally from the canonesses of the regular of the Holy Sepulchre. Don't ask me to translate that again or, or tell that again because I, I can't. <laughs> uh, but um, what is actually important, more important is that they moved away from their uh, original setting in 2012 when uh, their building, the cloister building, just next to the school building, uh, was turned into a school, a boarding school. It was already a boarding school under the roofs of the uh, ancient buildings and uh, it's just extended into the cloister uh, now these days. And um, well, when this, um, uh, this congregation moved out, because they were too old, they were actually going into retirement def indefinitely, uh, there was lots of concern about the heritage collection. As you know, cloisters assemble quite some heritage over uh, three, more than three and a half centuries. And this was the case. I mean, they had a, a nice gallery of 70th century pictures, <laughs> uh, paintings, uh, which is now being restored. 
Uh, that was only one of the, the topics, uh, because these glass plates were another. <laughs> to give you an example, they, were, they had extensive archives, which were uh, classified, put in the right boxes, and moved to Kadok. Uh, and they, you can look at these archives at Kadok now in Leuven, and you can research it in an online database, which is the advantage of working together with such an institution. But, and then, of course, the uh, architectural heritage was taken care of because the school buildings were transformed, still are transformed, and they are doing a very good job at that, I can, I can tell you. Uh, and then, of course, all the rest of it, and that was collections. Uh, what about them? I told about the paintings, but it, it, it's full. And the buildings are really full. You go in any room which is not used for teaching, and it's full. It's really stocked with, uh, and one of the examples is here, a large cellar uh, completely <laughs> full of heritage. And if you don't look neatly at it, you can make lots of big mistakes. Uh, it looks like, oh yes, it's all piles of books, etc. But there are really unique items in there too, and you have to really weed them out. Um, let's say separate the chaff from the, from the wheat. And um, that's what we're doing. And they started um, in 2012, 12, 2012, they started with five teachers uh, actually teaching history and art history at the institution. But that was uh, such an overwhelming task that they, they didn't really <laughs> get very far. They did a lovely job, I uh, must be honest, but it was too much. And so we uh, started again in 2022 with all these partner organizations to really help them how to do this kind of large-scale operation within the confines of an active school. You have to take that into account, too, which is rebuilt <laughs> as a school. So there's lots of uh, works going on and, and stones being cut inside the building, giving huge amounts of, of dust and this kind of dust combination. And so we, um, we recruited 22 volunteers uh, among the retired staff of the school, not only teachers, but also people working in the school library, for instance, uh, people, caregivers, uh, night uh, people st staying over at night in, in the boarding school, and there they are. And what we did actually was train them for two whole days. They got a, a really <laughs> a training, uh, received two days of training, and then we applied that training to the collection direct way. We just started, and we bought also all this lovely white um, <laughs> um, white uh, dust, com dust shirts and, and mount caps because we were in full f operating in full COVID uh, last year. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we did fantastic work. In one week time, most of the collection was separated in sub-collections. We had a lovely uh, corridor with all these small boxes of the boarding school under the roofs. You see all these very small chambrettes with two beds folding out of the of the wall and we just fold up all these beds against the wall and we put all the uh, different kinds of heritage in each box we had 30 boxes or something at a certain point and what we're now doing is uh, counting everything and uh, trying to make evaluation of what is worth keeping because it's too much um, and so we focus on conservation and accessibility, that's right. And of course, everything is supervised and coached by this uh, professional organization. But the, 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 the real work, the dirty work is done by the volunteers. I can tell you, we are in there too with our volunteers. And I myself, the first days, you have to show them. So you will have to put on such a white uh, sheet as well and, and, and work hard and make your hands dirty. But for us as uh, Erfurt Norden Camper, the, the, the project started a bit earlier with this uh, lovely uh, collaboration with the museums of uh, Turnhout, which is called Project E, Projectie, Projectie in Dutch means projection. And uh, it, is, it was actually a large project running for six months. Uh, the results of that preparation went much longer and was based on one large uh, glass plate collection of Van Hall. Uh, we discovered in the city archives together with the, the archivist, the new archivist there, Bart Sass, and he decided, well, we have to do something about it. What can we do? So we digitized the entire set, I think 3,500 plates, and we um, uh, decided to build a project around that to investigate how many other glass plates were there. And if I look back at this uh, nice map you created, well, you can double the figures from the Northern Camp uh, by this time because uh, we, we just received enormous uh, amounts of information due to uh, uh, our efforts. And uh, we did this uh, exposition of how projection technology evolved, but also how, what was the use of that. We discovered a lovely uh, correction, uh, um, collection of glass plates from uh, the Art Academy. 
uh, with nudes, <laughs> actually uh, erotic art, you can say, and uh, they, we showed it also in this co in this exposition, and we trained. This is Anne Deckers uh, from the Photo Museum, the collection head of collections here in this building, and uh, she trained our volunteers to how to manage these plates, how to clean them, how to handle them, and how to digitize them. And we did some collections, uh, as you can see. Oh, back there in the top right we have a guy photographing large technical plates um, Lindhoff plates uh, five, a5 format approximately uh, showing from an electricity company so all these early electricity buildings were really little castles they built inside in in the center of the of the villages where they distributed electricity and there you are they are digitized and they are online now in our data bank and so the key of this um, uh, exposition is now um, in inside the school building because we kept also of course all these slides coming to the exposition and most of these lanterns you saw in the exposition were coming from the school Heligov, and they are now in the wall in the conference room uh, as from after the exposition 2012. Um, trying to press here um, and so of course they were digitized <laughs> many thanks for that it's uh, fantastic to have uh, the outcome uh, nearly 10 years after we started the, the project it's uh, long-term thinking here um, and so we are now describing them by the same volunteers we are training three more volunteers now next week and the, the way the, the week after that to really do the metadata made metadata have them correctly have them verified etc um, and we have our own data bank uh, base for that. We have a collective access set up for the better of the last uh, 12 years. And so we manage that ourselves entirely and we are responsible for the entire technical side of that. And we are not only doing that, we are uh, presenting also on this uh, website, www.campusfood.be. And um, what you can do there is really zoom in on the slides as you can do with most of this presentation websites as well um, which is also very important to say is that we encounter lots of diversity which is intriguing and we hope that some interesting conclusions can be read in the in the phds uh, that are uh, produced right now and the book that is published is one of these uh, old, very old uh, lanterns it's i think it's a candlelight uh, uh, based that one we have gas lit, we have early electricity versions as well. Um, and this is of course the start of something new, uh, because once it's out in the open, digitized and presented online, you can share it. And that's what we're planning to do. We are not only sharing it, we are using the data from our database to present it in the one database, which is online accessible for the public. But in fact, that's a collection of many other databases. In fact, we are working via API-based system and we're taking over data from at least five databases now and end of the year it will be seven and next year it will be probably eight or nine. So we're adding more and more data to that same website and um, yeah, uh, we have an API ourselves so we can reshare those data because we own we are having uh, contracts with all the content partners as well, so we can share that as well. If you're interested in sharing it in Laterna Magica uh, database, uh, we're open to discuss that. Because we manage that ourselves, we pay that ourselves, we can decide that ourselves. Um, and so we are still further investigating new collections emerging virtually every week now. We're starting in September in, uh, Helle, in the Klein Seminari Hoogstraat, another large, large school. And it's interesting to, to see the, the contrast there because they're also a religious institution like the, the one in Turnhout. But the Turnhout was for girls and was very progressive in its days uh, when the lantern slides were used. In the 20s or 30s, they were very progressive. They were focusing on not only on religion, but also on exact sciences, scientists. And so for girls, at that time, that was progressive. And the others uh, were a boys' institution dedicated to trained priests. So we, were, we are very curious to see what um, kind of... Um, of slideshows they were using. I mean, that, that must be a different, uh, different story. And that was my, my story. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kor. I know you can keep on talking with us, but uh, we can do it after um, the session. And now I want to invite Richard. I think Richard 
is very well known uh, <laughs> for the most of you. Uh, but for those who don't know Richard, Richard is, um, let's say, uh, yeah, an expert for many years already in the Magic Lantern, wrote different several publications, co-edited books, but he's also the treasurer and the secretary of the Magic Lantern um, uh, Society, sorry. And um, what else to say? Yeah, of course, the Lucena database, it's uh, your little baby, I would say. And, and uh, today we, uh, we are, are collaborating, uh, Be Magic and Richards, uh, to implement also many of our uh, digitized slides uh, in Lucena. I give the word to Richard. Well, hello everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I hope that most people here will at least have heard of Lucerna or seen it, uh, possibly even used it, uh, so I'm not going to take up time going back over its history. You can read a few of the numbers there if you want. When I first discovered lantern slides as a research area, the fundamental problem was how to find enough material to work on. That was 30 years ago. Now the problem is how to deal with the massive amount of material we have to work on. There's no absolute need to try to approach this through data gathering and analysis. It's quite okay to take the traditional humanities approach of making an intellectual assessments based on what we can find writing those up in more or less subjective and creative accounts of what we think it all means. As a literature graduate, I like that approach. But data gathering and analysis is a powerful approach if used well. Um, as an engineering graduate, um, a long time ago, uh, I respond to that as well. However, it's not simply about aggregating data and crunching numbers statistically to prove this or that interpretation. For all the mass of slides, catalogues, press references, and other data that's now coming to light, we still have far too many gaps in the continuum to be able to draw truly reliable conclusions by machine-based methods alone. So what we need are tools to help understand the shape and size of what we're looking at, to work around and over the gaps, and to try to find and understand the internal structures and meanings within the data. The last part of that comment is the more important one. There are many connections, overlaps, repetitions, variations, solutions, and further problems in the mass of information. We, we can't then just take a surface interpretation. We have to dig more deeply, and that must include comparisons between different bodies of material across national borders, and across time periods. Aggregating the information together is only the first step, but it is the most fundamental. Proper humanities-based analysis depends then on being able to be selective and being able to be effectively or accurately or truthfully, perhaps, selective depends on having a meaningful structure to the data. In an ideal world, pause for effect, <laughs> our data should be structured to allow many alternative overlapping meaningful structures to be selected. Now, Lucerna doesn't claim to be the meaningful structure, but it does attempt to offer a meaningful structure with the scope to improve. Uh, it seems to me, to an engineering approximation, Lucer the way Lucerna stores information is about as good as we need to get for the time being. On the other hand, there's a lot of room for improvement in the interfaces that human beings can use to get information into and out of Lucerna. But that's a two-way process, and that's really why we're not further ahead with it, uh, particularly given the COVID hiatus. So far, it's proved hard to establish real, practical collaborations. Improving Lucerna's usability for data input and output will take time and work, 
but above all, it needs to be an ongoing development that's informed by how institutions work with their collections, how researchers work with data and artifacts, and how those activities can be made more effective. What I'm going to talk about from here on uh, is really a case study of an example from the Be Magic project that we're, we're trying to make work really as a, as a test for how the process might work for future collaborations. Uh, this is uh, the collection of the Musée de la Phot Photographie in Charleroi. Uh, 3,600 slides were selected for digitization from a larger collection. The digitization, as you'll see shortly, is excellent. Uh, all the slide images you're going to see are from that collection, and they were created by the colleagues in Cardoc. The recording of this collection at the moment, as you see up there, uh, is typical of the way most institutions approach collections of slides, if they list them at all. A basic outline, um, an Excel sheet in this case, of groups of slides, uh, boxes or donations, without much detail of what the groups contain or what the slides themselves actually are. With large collections and limited resources, uh, and if I may say so, uh, less than widespread knowledge of the slide medium, that's not surprising. The first step in trying to make sense of all of this stuff, um, the, the slide images arrived in several we transfers, totaling 3,600 images in one big folder. Uh, the first step is to try to arrange these in a basic way, so I've divided them all up into uh, folders, smaller groups, based on some logical premise. In this case, the folders match the accession IDs in the Charlois collection. But they could have been grouped in various other ways, um, original slide sets, manufacturers, subjects, storage locations. There are, there are many different things, and whatever makes, makes logical sense in some way is the best idea. Uh, one reason for dividing up like this is, of course, practical. Uh, if you try opening one folder with 3,600 3, slides, you can go for lunch and several other meals before it illustrates all of the, the thumbnails. Within the folders, in the accession groups, the images had already been given individual serial numbers, as you can see, as their file names. Uh, in this case, though, those reflect the order in which they were photographed rather than individual accession numbers within the collection. Uh, so that's a question really to be resolved with the institution. How do they want to identify their slides? Can we do it in Lucerna and pass it back to them? Uh, something like that. Probably the most important single stage after digitization and the one that requires the most thought is identifying the slides. What, what actually are these things? It depends a lot on the level of description that we're prepared to settle for, and there's no definitive standard. If it's good enough to record something as lantern slide, or maybe lantern slide showing women in historical costume, say for taking a collection inventory, that, that's fine. But for more detailed contextualization that enables more thorough research, which is really what Lucerna is supposed to enable, we need to know more. Who made it? When? Why? How was it used? Where did the images come from? You can write your own list. In this example, uh, we're quite lucky. There are labels on the slides with a recognized name, Elie Mazo of Paris. Uh, in this case, I would say Mazo is actually the maker of the slides, though labels very often identify retailers rather than makers. And even more lucky, we have several slide catalogues uh, published by Mazo, uh, and some have been digitized. Uh, in this case, it was during the Million Pictures project, uh, thanks to the initiative of Sarah Delman and other colleagues. So, uh, it still takes time and work because even searchable catalogues don't always reveal their contents very quickly. We can find the relevant 
It's up there. Uh, the relevant published set for those costume slides that I just showed you and assign some metadata to them as a result. It gets easier with practice and knowledge, so less time, less work. So one critical factor here in identifying slides is having experienced personnel, or at least personnel who are interested enough in the subject to become experienced. So a Lucerna record can be created for this set if it doesn't already have one. In this case, it didn't have one, so I've created one based on the, the record in the Mazo catalogue. Uh, in many cases, uh, so far mainly British uh, commercial slides, catalogue-based records for the slide sets have already been entered in the Lucerna database, which makes recording the existence of these slides in this collection much more straightforward. Uh, Lucerna records metadata at the level of a slide set. Uh, it can also list the slides within the set. Unfortunately, the Mazo catalogue doesn't identify individual titles for each slide, but conceivably, if we could find lecture readings or something like that, we possibly could. Otherwise, we give them descriptive titles, uh, woman in 19th century costume, or whatever it may be. Uh, and we can record the contemporary references and other supporting information that we find. Something else to look at. Uh, again, with a bit of time and experience and the sort of lateral thinking that's needed for any kind of successful research, Lucerna can often help to identify slides found in collections. Here, the slide from Charlois helpfully carries a set title at the top and a slide title at the bottom. It's not always obvious which is which, and many slides don't carry either of those, uh, and, but I was able to use those for searching in Lucerna, and it turns out we already have another example of the same slide so I can identify the Charlois slide against an existing Lucerna ID number. Fine. Um, actually, it's more complicated than that. Uh, possibly, I think this is the same image, but used in different set contexts, uh, in which case we need to decide whether these are examples of the same published item or different published items. Uh, here I suspect the latter, but I don't really have time to debate that just now. Uh, it's an image by G.W. Wilson of Aberdeen, um, but in the Charlois example, I think it's reused in a different set by the Wesleyan Methodist Sunday School Union of London. Here are two views that some of you might recognise. Uh, along with the Lucerna record for one of them, in this case we, we don't yet have a, a reference image in Lucerna, but we will do, uh, the identif identification... Uh, sorry, identification is easy enough, though, based on the slide set title, uh, uh, slide numbers, and the maker's trademark. Uh, though the latter is only useful, again, given some researcher knowledge, that that's the trademark of York and Son of London. Moving along. Uh, two more of the Charlois slides. Uh, these are from around 150 of these fine images, really fine collection, uh, by Gantz of Zurich. The point of including these is, is twofold. They, they don't yet have records in Lucerna, and we don't yet know of any catalogues or other records of Gantz's slide manufacture. Secondly, they do have numbers. There and there. Um, but they appear to be from two separate sets, Schweiz and Frankreich. So were those produced as two separate commercial entities or as a single large set or as a list from which individual slides could be selected by a purchaser? Um, we don't know yet, but it does make a difference to how we create records in Lucerna and how we identify and describe things like this. I, I just love that mountaintop whatever it is. I, I really don't want to go to a dance party in there. <laughs> a, 
couple more examples of Mazo slides from Charlois um, to illustrate a fairly basic point about digitizing slides. What's wrong with that picture? Okay, I'll, I'll save time. It's the wrong way round. You can't actually tell at this resolution. Uh, there's a number on the bus which is the wrong way round, but the building itself is symmetrical. It's a bit clearer in this one where there's lettering. Uh, so most lantern slides do have a right way round, and an audience will usually recognise when they're the wrong way round. To give, um, sorry, the the reason for it being photographed this way, of course, is because there's all this wonderful metadata that we need to record. Uh, but as Sabine was saying, to do it its full justice, we would need to take two photos of both sides. But I think my maths are correct here. That means twice as much work. Uh, twice as much time, twice as much money. Or it means having to compromise with perfection, uh, which is a reasonable thing to do in an imperfect world. But in that case, we have to make the compromise clear to the researchers who are likely to use the images. Uh, another one. This one is for Valentine, if she's here. Um, it's not quite your place, but it's the same lake. Um, a couple more examples of the same situation. These are privately made slides from somebody's holiday photos of a tour in Switzerland. It, it's easy to identify the location. I think it's pretty well known, uh, Chateau de Chillon. Um, but you have to know the location to recognize that, again, this is the wrong way around. That one's a bit more obvious if you can read the lettering. Um, an experienced eye would spot things like this. Uh, you can also just detect the emulsion of the, of the photographic image, which normally is hidden by the paper mount of the slide. Um, five quick random observations on problems that this raises. Good results take work. Work takes time and people. Those take money. Two, meaningful structures for data, especially interchangeable ones, imply some degree of standardization or at least agreement between multiple interests. Three, creating data resources tends not to be fundable by research-focused sources. And those funding sources and institutions are less interested in breaking new ground than in continuing existing debates and generating public or political impact. You know all this. Four, it's changing, but as a generalization, there aren't enough people who understand both the nuances of the lantern field and its artifacts and the nuances of digital approaches to gathering, storing, analyzing information. And five, related risk, people outside digital humanities sometimes take the view that A, IT is really easy and just happens magically without any great input of work or thought. And or B, listing data in a spreadsheet of your own design on your own computer is all you need to do. Um, I, I could go on and on all night, uh, but <laughs> it's probably better if I stop my rant there. <laughs> um, I'll be, be very happy to expand further or take questions at the end. Thank you very much. So now we come to our final uh, presentation. Um, I welcome Angela Santos and uh, Santos and Marcia Villarigues. Both are at the Department of Conservation and Restoration, and they both work also for the Vicarte Research Unit of the Nova University of Lisbon. Both work in the field of conservation and restoration of cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, the next talk will be presented by Angela, and it's called Preventive Conservation Challenges of Hand-Painted Magic Lantern Slide Glass Slides. Here, and this is the pointer. Okay. 
So, um, good afternoon, um, and thank you for the introduction and uh, for having me here. Uh, so I will talk about the preventive conservation challenges of hand-painted uh, slides. That is part of the work uh, I've been developing during my PhD with uh, Vanessa Otero and Marcia Villarix. Um, and this investigation will also continue with the project Magica that I will introduce to you at the end. Just to uh, briefly introduce ourselves, we discovered and uh, fell in love with this fascinating world uh, not so long ago. Um, we are conservation scientists uh, with different backgrounds and experience in glass and painting. And so when we started this investigation, we thought that the best way we could contribute was by studying these slides in terms of uh, their materiality. Um, so, as we know, the slides um, have different production techniques that evolve throughout time with uh, hand painting, printing and photography, and these have different conservation needs. In terms of hand painted uh, glass slides, we know that um, these uh, pose uh, significant conservation challenges and we didn't find any uh, guidelines in terms of conservation. Uh, these have been exposed to extreme conditions of temperature and light and that is the main reason why we, they have such problems. Given our fields of study, uh, we decided to focus um, on these slides by shedding light on their conservation problems, characterizing their painting materials and techniques, and um, the glass used as support. So we could increase our knowledge uh, in, in terms of uh, conservation um, to propose the first preventive conservations for these type of slides. So when we talk about conservation, we consider all measures and actions aimed at safeguarding uh, cultural heritage while ensuring is, its accessibility to present and future generations. And conservation embraces uh, preventive conservation, interventive conservation and restoration. So as starting point, we uh, focus on the first preventive conservation guidelines. And this consists of uh, indirect actions that minimize and prevent uh, future deterioration or losses. So they do not uh, interfere directly with materials nor change their aspects and involve um, registration, storage, sec uh, security, environmental conditions, some of the things that we have been talk in previous presentations. And uh, preventive conservation is uh, recognized as the most effective mean of promoting long-term preservation. And it always considers the influence of these 10 uh, deterioration agents. To complement general guidelines for uh, heritage collections with recommendations specific for this type of slides, we access three uh, collections, um, Portuguese collections, um, focusing on the hand-painted and hand-painted with printed outlines from 18th and 19th century produced in other European countries. To develop these guidelines, sorry, to develop these guidelines, we consider uh, three main aspects, uh, technical studies that included a review of historical documents about materials and techniques, used to produce uh, these slides. Since we were the first to study their materials systematically, it was essential to understand what could we expect. The chemical characterization of the slides to identify the materials applied and degradation problems, and assessment of the state of preservation of the slides from the Portuguese collections. There was also a questionnaire to other collections of slides that uh, gave us a brief insight to, into uh, current conservation procedures undertaken and um, understand um, what were the, the, their needs and so we could emphasize um, 
the best the, the aspects that needed more improvements. And also, uh, of course, a literature review on conservation parameters so we could um, understand what were the best uh, ways um, to, um, given the different susceptibilities of the different materials that we have. Within the technical studies, we looked into 18th and 19th century literature that explained um, the process of production and the materials used from the glass support to the painting materials and the techniques. For example, in terms of uh, glass support chosen, we verified that the, the, it was extremely important for them to select good quality glass that was really thin. And some authors even mentioned specific glass techniques and um, compositions. And these information, along with uh, the analysis, is, uh, can help us attribute the, the glass to a specific time and place of production. In terms of painting materials and techniques, we know that oils and watercolors were applied along with varnishes. And the number of colors was quite restricted due to the importance of transparency. Um, their technique descriptions allow us to understand the painting processes and also to imagine a possible stratigraphy where varnishes play different roles. This knowledge uh, helped us develop a multi-analytical methodology that we applied to around 50 slides, revealing a correlation between historical literature and the, the slides itself. With X-ray fluorescence, we detect elements present in the glass, and with this, we can um, understand the glass composi composition and find groups, uh, also narrow down um, dates and places of production of some slides with this information. And in some cases, we can also identify the production technique and complement it with the chemical composition, which help us in attributions. By using this technique allied with UV visible, Raman, FTIR spectroscopies, we could identify the colors observed, so we could follow um, the evolution of the color palette over time and see drastic changes between 18th and 19th century, for example, with the introduction of new colors in the 19th century. Find differences between um, slides manufacturers and countries and in terms of conservation, we can also find uh, light-sensitive colorants such as organic yellows and reds and uh, deterioration products already in the resinous binders. Finally, with optical microscopy, we could understand painting techniques through the morphology and also observe color alterations as in this slide, the bottom was in contact with the glass, so it is in better conditions than the top. With the assessment of uh, the state of preservation of the Portuguese collections, we understood that uh, more than 10% is at risk of total loss. And um, it was also possible to identify the main conservation problems, it, which was essential to uh, recommend suitable practices. I also point out that the slides in worse conditions were the ones in uh, from the 18th century, so the oldest ones, but we already have 19th century slides with terrible problems. The online uh, questionnaire gave us a brief insight into the care practice applied to 20 um, institutions and collections. And in terms of the, their context, the number of slides varied significantly. And although um, 17th century slides are relatively rare, a lot of uh, those collections have 18th century slides, and we know that these oldest are the ones we are more worried about. And um, in terms of preventive conservation, um, we know that not all have uh, inventory and digital images, as we saw in the other presentations, and um, not all of them um, are able to control and monitor their uh, environmental conditions in storage and display, nor have uh, integrated pest management programs. Eleven institutions hold uh, reenactment shows, and seven of them use original slides. 
um, the most common damages were basically the same as we find in Portuguese collections. It was also interesting to have the feedback of caretakers from um, for institutions that explicitly express their concern about these collections due to the lack of personnel, dedicated time and knowledge about magic lantern slide conservation. Since there was um, nothing published uh, about conservation of hand-painted slides and only a few information about cold painting on glass, the literature review was focused on the susceptibility of each material that we identified to propose the most appropriate um, conditions. For example, the detection of uh, light-sensitive materials, of course, influenced the light uh, guidelines. Just to, to summarize, these, these guidelines were designed to complement general uh, preventive conservation standards currently established. So we addressed recommendations for the collection's identification with an inventory uh, detailed, associating the conservation assessment and related documentation, such as tests and catalogs. Also, uh, still inside the registration topic, we emphasize the importance of uh, digitization by referencing to other uh, projects that develop much further this question. In terms of environmental conditions, um, are, these are fundamental to control since we have composite objects with organic and inorganic materials. For example, organic materials such as wood and painting can contract and expand with different temperature and relative humidity. And in sandwich slides, uh, so to say, condensation can occur, which causes, for example, fungi uh, growth and glass deterioration. And with light-sensitive materials, such as wood, paper, and colorants in the paintings, it is essential not only to eliminate ultraviolet and infrared emissions, but also to reduce the intensity of this light and exposure time. For example, I bring you this uh, dramatic case of uh, this slide that was for two years um, in display. And it was with uh, LED lamps, so no UV or heat emission. However, the LEDs were inside the cabinet, directly on the slide, constantly on from the, every time the museum was open. And it was too strong, so it was receiving up to 10,000 lux instead of 50. We also want to keep away fine particles, so um, regular cleaning of the collections is essential. For example, dust is abrasive, attracts moisture and promotes uh, deterioration. Also, organic components serve as food for pests. So integrated pest management plans and regular monitoring are vital to detect if we have insects feeding on our collection's wood. In terms of storage and display, it is important to have only neutral pH materials in contact with the slides and not have any material touching the painting. Also, the boxes and display cases should always allow ventilation to reduce the risk of condensation, mainly due because of the glass. And finally, the vertical position should be avoided um, every time possible to reduce the risk of degraded paint falling from the glass with vibrations. In terms of uh, handling, of course, we should do it the least possible to avoid impacts and vibrations and have our hands very clean or use natural gloves. And uh, finally, we also included some recommendations for performative projections or demonstrations. We advise using replicas to um, protect historical slides from handling temperature and light during projections. Um, and but uh, some solutions uh, can help us reduce the amount of, of damage, for example, by installing LED limelight systems with no UV or heat emission on the magic lanterns. Nevertheless, we should keep in mind that uh, the light damage is cumulative. So, and, and these LEDs can emit um, 9,000 lux, which causes uh, decoloration, of course. So this topic is definitely needs more studies to find better solutions. Um, we want, uh, if you want to know more about our work, uh, you can also check this recent publication. 
uh, that was dedicated to conservation, uh, along with some others that are available on the website I'll present next. This investigation will uh, continue within uh, the project Magica that just started. It's a three-year uh, project uh, that um, addresses both immaterial and material aspects uh, of the use of magic lantern in Portugal. In one side, it intends to find relations between slides and cultural, theatrical and didactic life and understand its significance allied to the use of music, text and illusions. On the other hand, uh, it focuses on uh, preserve the materiality of the slides without compromising the use of the slides repository uh, and engage with the public. By assessing several uh, slide collections from Portugal and repositories of uh, musical theater pieces, we want to renew the historiographic discourse and encourage reflection on the fruition for a contemporary audiences. We will continue investigating the production materials and techniques of painted uh, slides to unveil their degra degradation mechanisms and further develop these uh, preservation strategies. And we want to restore the Magic Lantern image as one of the first and most exciting projecting technologies and tell the story of their social impact in Portugal that is not uh, studied at all. Our team has um, conservation scientists, theater and music science specialists, historians, media archeologists and museum curators that will count on the help of great advisors and collaborating entities. And our project is uh, already available, uh, so p please feel free to, to visit and find more, more about our work and all the publications we did before starting this project. And thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, all the speakers, but also the audience, because we are running out of time, I'm afraid. But I hope you still have a few minutes left for a, a question. For a, no, 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 it's finished already, <laughs> the panel. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Okay. We, we just have to be on time for the performance at 6.30 which is at Bernard, so we need some time to go there, but we, we still have some time for questions, so because don't worry. Just around the corner, you may need, let's say, uh, six, seven minutes when yeah. you are there. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if somebody already has a question for one of our speakers. I can come to you with the microphone. Yeah, Wouter. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the for the uh, presentations. Um, my question is for Brecht, um, because I was thinking of a lawsuit in the Netherlands a few years ago um, about uh, I think postcards that were put online, and then uh, there, there there was a, a problem with the copyrights, and and the archive was sued, or the average institution was sued for thousands of euros. <laughs> so I wonder how you, uh, if you also think about those things or how, how you deal with that. Thank you for bringing the mic. It gives me 10 seconds to think about that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, good question indeed. It's a very particular case what you mentioned there because, I mean, there are circumstances and, and, and in that particular lawsuit that maybe I wouldn't have taken. But um, 
um, let's say that um, when it comes to the to the public access to this kind of collections, we are um, we have a few copyright experts in our team. So that's one 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 thing that 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 is very advantageous in this in this case, um, which uh, have developed me methods to, um, to to create risk estimations because that's what you're talking about when you're talking copyrights. It's all about risk es estimations. I mean. Um, and furthermore, um, the decision whether something can be disclosed upon Memo's own platforms is always in the hands of the content partners themselves. It's not us who will decide whether we are allowed to put it online, yes or no, it's the content partners. So if they see any copyright risk, they can already block us from, from uh, presenting it on, on our platforms. And for what they do on their own platforms, they are the, they are responsible themselves, uh, of course. Um, I we haven't particularly done any research into um, copyright uh, matters when it comes to lantern plates or glass plates in uh, general, in particular. But I think it's an interesting uh, subject that we'll have to tackle in the following months in order to prepare for our access phase. Thank you. There was another question. Yes. Yeah. I just have a kind of a quick comment slash question. So, but I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, I started uh, going, starting my research a little bit later than Lucerna began. And um, I, I doubt I could have finished my PhD without the resource. And um, it was about a decade ago that I was finally able to go up to Richard and say, hi, thank you so much. I love your work, blah, blah. Um, it, it's just incredible. And I also think that, uh, you know, in the talk, I think that a manifesto needs to kind of be written. And, um, you know, don't use machine-based methods to support a theory should be like the top item. Because, you know, even Sherlock Holmes said it's a capital mistake to let data, you know, twist twist it to a theory. You know, you have to start with the object first. And so, you know, anybody making a database of this kind of stuff needs to kind of create it so that it can allow for a synchronic and diachronic study and also the possibility for individual insights, you know, and original insights, but only if you look at the object first and let it lead you to that. So I just want to say that. But also, um, I, uh, I have an artisanal you know, digitization project that those who are at a, a million pictures um, know about. And so I was able to do everything at the highest resolution and transparent and reflective scans and marry them in Photoshop and get all the information. Everybody knows that. Um, but I, as I try to put, you know, want to put it up on the web, I'm wondering if, you know, given that there are some disturbing images and stuff, if any of you guys want to speak to kind of language that you might use, you know, with regard to that. Somebody who wants to... Uh, thanks, Artemis. I love your work too. Um, disturbing images in in the sense of racial images, or um, what? Um, so far as well, if I can speak for Lucerna, so far as we have a policy, it's that we publish but with a disclaimer. Um, it's not exactly a pre-warning that you are about to see potentially disturbing content, um, although in some cases you get the warning when you get the list of things which you then click to see the actual image, and that's possibly the, the solution that I would favour. Um, it, it's a very difficult one. Uh, the thing that struck me most is that uh, what is offensive or what may be offensive is so subjective that I didn't feel at all qualified to make prejudgments about it. Um, at the same time, we have to recognize that it's a real issue, uh, particularly in terms of racial images or possibly, I mean, I, I can't think of any in Lucerna uh, of this kind, but um, highly offensive sexual images, for instance. Um, to a certain extent, uh, we've taken a stand and we're waiting for somebody to complain. 
I, I'm aware that's not a, a very viable long-term strategy, um, but it, it's the best practical thing we could do. Uh, we've got material, we republish it, uh, we're prepared to put a warning on it or uh, disclaim uh, any support for it, uh, and want to see what happens next, really. Uh, I'm sure someone else can comment better on that line. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Nobody else? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. I have one for Richard. We are just starting to um, meta, to put in the metadata of our series. So we should discuss what we should put in there because we have all the information, or we could go for the information because we have the slides live. In, uh, with the volunteers in the same institution so they could check some things if this is important could help you to provide with better meet metadata uh, just tell us what we should do and then we do that <laughs> we have lots of volunteers we can do it it doesn't cost money actually lots of time and dedication <laughs> Uh, volunteers do cost money, um, <laughs> different sort of money. Um, I, th I think in terms of the metadata, let's say for a lantern slide, uh, what I was seeing in um, Brecht's uh, presentation and, and yours is that if you apply common sense and, and a critical researcher's eye, then you probably come up with more or less the same things um, as I would or you would or anyone else. Um, I'm very, very happy to uh, to correspond with you or anybody else about what standard Lucerna does things to. Uh, I'm not going to claim it is the best standard. It's a working approximation and it's uh, open for debate or improvement. But, but actually, when you're describing a lantern slide, title, size, materials, um, other format aspects, um, then if you get into uh, keywording the content, you know, the image content is a whole other thesis subject, uh, but just the physical description of the thing is reasonably straightforward, I think, and it's more a case of what you actually call things um, and the way you divide the information down. So, for example, do you put the various dimensions in separate data fields or one narrative data field that could be different for every researcher who puts it in? It's, it's about data control, but um, people like us know how to do that. <laughs> Oh, no, this, there is a question from the audience. I don't know. Uh, so my, my, my main question is, uh, so for two, two questions, in fact. Concerning the database, how, um, because I've never seen the internal architecture, but I know from other database systems that at the end they are not compatible by when we are using different research things. So it would be really nice that we can... Uh, of course, Lucerna is kind of becoming the the center right now, but it's it's another database. But if we have interconnected databases and, and somehow that we could research and compare images and, you know, uh, because I'm sure there are museums already have like the Met or big museums that they have their own collections already digitalized. And as a researcher, it would be really nice if the basic architecture works in a way that we can use uh, other, when needed, other research motors, not, uh, ways of doing the, the research, not, not the database itself. Um, my, no, then the, that's, yeah, probably forgot the second one. So it's, it's <laughs> well, yes, well, if you have the same kind of databases integrating data from others, you always have to do the, the research and how you do that. You receive data, but you have to map it to your own structure, and that's a pretty tough job. <laughs> it's not nice to do. It's a really dirty work. You have to test that. You have to see what it gives and then test again. And only when you're really satisfied with the result, you should do it. But it's it's a longer work mostly than you think. And the more biggest problem is often that the quality of the data you receive is not uh, to scratch. I mean. Um, 
people are people making mistakes, are seeing the things differently over time. So they start in one way to note down things and after a thousand pieces they come to another version of that. <laughs> but if you export data, you get confronted with that difference. And and that's what we see all the time, but that's the, the dirty job of database integration. We, we are used to do that. <laughs> A last question from the audience, last one. Yeah, um, hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I guess I wanted to ask about the aspect of volunteers, um, whether you're going to have your databases open so that people can in fact add information, tag, all that kind of stuff, uh, add corrections. Um, I work for the National Library, we have Trove, which is a massive digital database and of course if there weren't the digital volunteers who have been able to correct the OCR uh, lots of people would never find um, what they need to know in those digitized newspapers and journals and so on because um, they don't make a lot of sense you know people who are specialists are able to correct uh, the OCR uh, they're also able to add information, you know, like it's a fairly open database. You can, um, the library will work with people to design an API so that they can actually harvest uh, information from other collections. And I think um, it's really important to keep the data open and to work with others so that you can uh, expand databases and um, uh, create structures where you can um, map other collections and you know I, I think that becomes more and more possible uh, so yeah I was just going to I wanted to know if you're with all your projects you're intending for that to be able to ha be uh, to happen somebody who wants to comment yeah, I, I can obviously only uh, agree, but um, I, I want to add uh, this aspect that you're mentioning now, user-generated me metadata. Um, it's my one of my own um, areas of research that um, we have to look, that's my opinion, at um, how different uh, strategies to create metadata can reinforce each other. Uh, we have the traditional manually created metadata, we have the um, very promising technologies of image recognition and the like and we have user generated metadata and we have also and that is also a domain in which I think we should be more uh, active maybe not so applicable onto lantern plates and this kind of stuff but if we as archivists can convince photographers to create proper metadata from the beginning of the production uh, process we can harvest them and bring them into the heritage collections from the beginning and those four big categories of metadata creation should in my opinion really force each other and I think it's up to the audiovisual archivists in general to know the strengths and weaknesses of these technologies these approaches and combine them into the best possible results for the purposes that they would like to serve um, yeah thank you I, I, again I couldn't agree more uh, the philosophy behind Lucerna is that it, it should be open source. Um, one of our role models is Wikipedia. The difference between Wikipedia and, let's say, Lucerna is about uh, critical mass. Um, you know, if you if you publish a page on Wikipedia, there's probably about a thousand people will jump on the errors. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that number, but um, if you publish something wrong in Lucerna it's entirely possible that nobody ever sees it and it's taken as truth. Um, I'd love to work with a, a body of volunteers. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, in the philosophy of, of Lucerna. Um, but I simply don't have resources to manage them. Um, Lucer uh, volunteers have to be moderated uh, in some fashion or other. They have to be trained, monitored, um, their mistakes corrected, um, un unless there is a critical mass that self-corrects. And there isn't in this subject, uh, it seems to me. Um, but also, I, you know, I, I just don't have any resources. Um, you're, you're looking at Lucerna's IT department and, and its editorial department and its finance manager. <laughs> 
Well, it's, it's very it's very simple. You need indeed to train your volunteers if you want to, to contribute uh, in detailed way with your data. The other aspects of public generated data, we take care of a different way. We receive a lot of comments and the moderation of that is another job. <laughs> And I don't like that job in particular. I want to deal with people directly. So I'm I'm training the volunteers to do the input work and the correction work, <laughs> but not the volunteers. Uh, everybody commenting on the database because that's that's another job. For me, that's different jobs. Basically, you have to moderate comments, but uh, who does the, who does that? Not me. I'm not not apt for that. For, for those who have more questions, I think you guys will join us to the performance, so please keep them and you can ask them individually.